My name is Nikolai Nowatsik. I, um, uh, I was in, um, in academia until recently. I was a postdoc in, in mathematics at Imperial College. And uh, at the moment, I am a consultant at Quaternion Risk Management. And in this talk, I'm going to um, uh, talk about um, spherical Voronoi diagrams, um, primarily about, um, about the spherical case. But in order to understand Voronoi diagrams, it makes sense to start with, with planar Voronoi diagrams. So these are like two slightly different versions of the same thing. Um, in both cases, I will try to give you an introduction that is as intuitive as possible. I will um, tell you how to um, formally um, write down these problems. And of course, we will discuss how to solve um, the problem of computing Voronoi diagrams in Python. And um, uh, in the second part, I would also like to highlight why this is a particularly a, particularly a Pi data story. Um, and hopefully, in the end, you will understand what that means. OK, so um, let's start with, with the first part, um, the planar Voronoi diagrams. Um, these look like this. So the easiest way to, to understand this is that maybe you just think of this, um, of this uh, um, graphic you see here as a simplified map of London. So imagine you're somewhere in London and um, you want to travel around. And these dots you see here are um, the black dots. These are um, the representing tube stations in London. It's just a simplified version. Um, you can roughly see the, the circle line and like a diagonal Piccadilly line uh, through that. And um, so if you are at some point in the plane um, in, in this map, you might wonder what is the closest tube station to you. And the Voronoi diagram is exactly um, what gives you this information. So if you are at any point, um, maybe around here, then this red shaded region is exactly the set of points where this tube station here is closest. And um, the Voronoi diagram computes this information for every point in the plane. So for, for, every, for every point in the plane, it tells you what generator point is closest to you. Um, so if, if you are, for instance, like in, near this tube station somewhere, somewhere here in this orange shaded region, then this is exactly the region where this tube station is closest. And as you can see, um, the Voronoi diagram gives you a partition of the entire plane uh, into these regions of closest distance to the tube stations. And um, the, the colors here are just chosen randomly. So, oh, sorry. Um, the colors here are just chosen randomly, so this is what a diagram looks like. And if you would like to play around with this yourself, I really would um, suggest that you do this uh, at some point, maybe later uh, after the talk or so. You can go to this website by Alex Beutel, and um, here's just a web applet where you really can like, click into an applet, um, put in some points, and then it gives you um, a Voronoi diagram like this. And he has kindly allowed me to use this graphics in this talk, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, so in general, the input into this uh, Voronoi diagram always is a set of points, and the output always is a set of regions surrounding these points, and these regions represent um, the, the points of closest distance to this point. Um, there is one uh, interesting thing you can see within this diagram here. Um, there, are slightly, there are two different types of regions. If you look in the, in the center, where we have the Piccadilly line uh, inside the circle line, these regions are of finite size. For instance, um, this, this green one here um, is bounded by these vertices here, and this region is finitely big. But the orange region here, um, this would be infinitely large if you really had an infinitely large map. Yeah? If this really isn't just a map of London, but really the mathematical plane R2, which infinitely spreads into all directions, then this would be a Voronoi cell, which is infinitely big whereas this is only finitely, uh, finitely big. OK, so I hope you've gotten some, some intuition on the, on the planar Voronoi diagram. Um, there is an abstract mathematical definition, um, which I just put in here for, um, for reasons of completeness. You can define Voronoi diagrams in a very general sense. You can define it in a so-called metric space. Um, this is basically anything where you can measure distances. And um, then this definition basically um, is the same as for the Euclidean case. So the input um, is a tuple P1 to PK of points, which we call generator points. And then um, the diagram comprises of a Voronoi region for each of these points. And for the kth point, the Voronoi region is defined as follows. It is the set of all points that are closest to the kth point. And closest in a general sense means that the distance 
um, is smallest among the distances to all the other points. If that, um, that, that abstract formulation doesn't help you, you can just skip it. I mean, it's really just uh, a formalization in, uh, in, in formula of this intuitive idea I've just shown you. This, this tuple, this P1 to PK, these are really just, this is really just an enumeration of these black dots. And this R1 to RK, these regions, these correspond to these colorfully shaded regions. And of course, um, this, uh, this object is very well understood. It's considered to be a standard piece of, um, of mathematics. It had also been studied by computer scientists, by people from computational geometry. And it's considered a rather standard problem, I think, since the 60s or so. And um, as a... Hmm? Also cosmology. Even in cosmology, fantastic. Um, so it's, a, it's very broad applications. And um, as a result, a lot of stuff is known about these diagrams. Uh, for instance, it is known that under very general conditions in the Euclidean plane, um, this problem is always solvable. And you even know that the shape of these regions, um, these will always be convex polytopes. And um, this is very good because if you think about how to store this information of a, of a diagram, uh, the fact that this is a convex polytope means essentially that you only have to store um, these vertices of this region and then you know that this is the region surrounding this point. So it cannot happen that it's like a very weird curved shaped uh, region um, in, in one of the Voronoi diagrams. Okay, so um, if you're more uh, interested in the, in, in the practicalities of, um, of using Voronoi diagrams, uh, I would suggest that you take a look at uh, SciPy um, and Matplotlib because with these two libraries, you can handle Voronoi diagrams um, in a very easy way. So essentially, all you have to do is, um, if, if, these are your, if these are your generator points, then um, all you have to do is you have to create a NumPy array and put these points into this NumPy array. And then you can just use matplotlib to plot them, and then you get this result. By the way, in the end of the talk, I will give you a link for an IPython notebook on GitHub, uh, which you can check out and play around with this yourself if you uh, would like to use this at some point. Okay, so these are the generator points, and um, if you want to actually compute the Voronoi diagram, you have to use the Voronoi class from SciPy Spatial. And um, once you import this class, all you have to do is you have to put your points into this Voronoi class, and then this here is an, is an object that does all the calculations for you. So this Vor variable um, contains all the information of this, uh, of this diagram, and if you want to plot it, the only thing you have to do is you have to import Voronoi plot 2D and put this calculated diagram into that function together with an access object. And then, as you can see, um, you get a plot with the generator points and these surrounding regions. Maybe we see that um, uh, uh, in succession. So, I mean, these are the generator points. And here you can see this split of the plane, again, uh, into these regions of closest distance. These dashed, um, these dashed lines here um, are... Um, so these lines are dashed because um, this is, a, again, a, a polytope that sort of goes to infinity. It tries to distinguish these polytopes that are sort of only finitely big from the ones that have, uh, yeah, you could say, a vertex at infinity. Okay, so very easy to do, um, to do Voronoi uh, diagrams in, uh, in Python once you have NumPy, Matplotlib, and uh, this class from SciPy Spatial. There's another class um, which might be interesting if you work with this. Um, I briefly would like to, to show you uh, this class. And this is something which is called the Delaunay triangulation. And the easiest way to think about the Delaunay triangulation is as follows. So if you look at this set of points, um, then just think about the obvious way to connect these points with lines. This would be like this. And Roughly speaking, this is the Delaunay triangulation. So um, it's sort of the, uh, the most canonical way to, uh, to triangulate a set of points. And this can also be done using um, this library from, from SciPy Spatial. So you simply import Delaunay from SciPy Spatial, you give it your points, and then you can plot um, the computed diagram using um, this, uh, this triplot. Very good question. So um, as I just said, um, so the, the term like obvious triangulation isn't mathematically very well defined. Um, if you want an exact definition of a Delaunay triangulation, here it is. <laughs> um, so, uh, Delaunay so, if you, so if you have a set of points, you can triangulate the set of points. This basically means that you connect the points with triangles. But sometimes this is not unique. There are multiple ways, as you just said, how to connect points to triangles. And the Delaunay triangulation um, tries to do this in a very special way. So the, 
the correct definition is that if P is the set of points which we have just seen, um, then a, tri a triangulation is a Delaunay triangulation if the circumhypersphere of any simplex to contain no point of P. That might not seem totally intuitive at the first glance, so the important information here is that sometimes triangulating points is not unique. So if you have only four points, for instance, like these, you could connect them uh, like this or like this. And um, this Delaunay triangulation is supposed to be very robust uh, and to, um, to be very compatible with processes like refinement and doing numerical computations and so on. Um, we won't need it in, in, in a lot of detail. I just mention it here because the Delaunay triangulation is often mentioned in parallel with these Voronoi diagrams. I'll show you in a second why. Um, yeah, basically the, the, the easiest uh, way to compute a Delaunay triangulation without Python is really you give this set of points to a five-year-old child and say, connect the points uh, with lines. And then most likely it will get the Delaunay triangulation. <laughs> um, the reason why it's often mentioned in connection with the Voronoi diagrams is if you plot both graphs at the same time, you see that they're kind of dual. There's this notion of dual graphs, and um, this is exactly um, what you can see here. So the blue points and the, the blue lines are the Delaunay triangulation, and the, um, the black lines are from the Voronoi diagram. And you see that these graphs, in terms of vertices and edges, um, are kind of dual. So as you can see, um, you can compute these, these, uh, these things in Python um, relatively easy, just a few lines of code, and um, then you get your diagram. And this is basically everything you need to know in order to work with planar Voronoi diagrams in Python. Are there any further questions regarding the, the planar case? Yes, please. Pardon me, I didn't get the question. So the, the, the input into this is always a set of points, these generator points. Yeah? Oh, you can. You can. You can add further points and then it recomputes the diagram, yeah. Yes. I think so, yeah. It has, I think it has a function for that. Okay. So basically, the, spherical, the problem of computing spherical Voronoi diagrams is exactly analogous to computing uh, planar Voronoi diagrams. And again, let's take traveling as an example. So assume you want to travel around the world and not only through London. Um, you can look at the, at the entire world. And this is like uh, roughly a sphere. And this is a map of the world. And the, the, uh, the input into the Voronoi diagram you see here is every airport on this planet. And then you would maybe like to know what is the closest airport. And this Voronoi diagram tells you exactly that. So if you look at this region um, of, the, of the Earth, you see that there are a lot of, um, of Voronoi regions here. This is because this roughly corresponds to Europe, and Europe has a lot of airports. <laughs> Uh, and here you see like Africa and this, uh, this is Russia. This is the Atlantic Ocean, so not many airports here. And um, at, this, uh, at this part here you see the US starting with again uh, many more airports. And um, if you want to compute spherical um, Voronoi diagrams and just play around with it, there's a similar web app um, by uh, Jason Davies uh, who kindly allowed me to use this in this talk. Um, and if you want to play around with spherical Voronoi diagrams just online by like, clicking in, adding some points, playing around with it, um, you can, for instance, try um, this, uh, this, this web app. Okay, so now, of course, the question, um, the question arises on how to do this in Python. And this is, is, is exactly why this is a PyData story. So almost exactly one year ago, um, there was PyData London 2015, and there was a talk about Voronoi diagrams uh, by Tyler Reddy. And if you ha haven't seen the talk, you can check it out uh, on YouTube. And uh, just for curiosity, so who was here at PyData 2015? Oh, so everybody's new. Perfect. So um, as you can see, uh, I included the introduction to Voronoi diagrams into my talk. Um, he also started explaining planar Voronoi diagrams and then moved on to spherical Voronoi diagrams. And um, he needed spherical Voronoi diagrams for his research. Um, he's also a postdoc in, um, he's in Oxford. And um, he tried to uh, solve the case of spherical Voronoi diagrams in Python as well. And 
Unfortunately, at this time, there was no ready-to-go implementation for spherical Voronoi diagrams in Python. He found a few uh, papers about the topic. I mean, it's not like an unsolved scientific mystery um, to, to uh, discuss spherical Voronoi diagrams. There are a few papers. But sometimes these papers are then very theoretical. They, they tell you things like, okay, so a solution exists and they try to estimate the complexities of algorithms that, that solve that. But if you really have just an, 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 a notepad or some, some PyCharm IDE and you want to code something that solves that, um, sometimes it's a bit, it requires a bit of work to, um, to extract from, from a theoretical paper on how to do a practical implementation. And he was basically at that point and um, Unfortunately, um, at this point, um, the implementation here didn't, didn't really work, and he uh, basically asked the audience if there is anyone who could help um, making this happen. And the interesting thing is, um, this talk, uh, because he posed this problem, this talk uh, caused quite a research collaboration. So Tyler uh, gave this talk in 2015, and at this time uh, I was in the audience, and I'm a mathematician, and my specialty is differential geometry. And this is an uh, part of mathematics that studies how geometries change if you move from flat spaces to curved spaces. And uh, another um, person in the audience was um, Ross Helmsley. He did a PhD in computational geometry, so a branch which studies how to do geometry with computers. And basically, after this talk, we had a chat uh, over there and um, thought, like, okay, so we have to be able to solve this problem and get this running uh, somehow in Python. And as you can see, um, we, we started this and then quickly more and more people got, got involved. Um, at some point, uh, Tyler opened this pull request on GitHub, uh, number 5232 of, um, of SciPy, and this initiated quite a long discussion on, on how to actually implement it and how to do it uh, and how to integrate this functionality into SciPy. Um, as you can see, quite a lot of um, uh, quite a lot of comments, a lot of commits. Um, it, it, it took quite some time to, to get it actually running. But fortunately, um, this uh, pull request has recently been merged. So if you ever want to compute um, a spherical Voronoi diagram in Python, you can use the current master branch of SciPy, or you have to wait till the next release. So it's probably going to be in the 018 release um, of the next version of SciPy, and then you can actually use this functionality. OK, so. Um, if you do this, um, then computing a spherical Voronoi diagram is actually as easy as computing a planar Voronoi diagram because it was our overall aim that the interface for the spherical Voronoi class, which we added to SciPy Spatial, is as similar as possible to the planar Voronoi class. So all you have to do is you have to uh, create a NumPy array with your points. This time, these points have to be on some sphere. And then you import the spherical Voronoi class and you call it. Uh, and you give its constructor the points on the sphere. And then it computes the spherical Voronoi diagram, just as the Voronoi class computes the planar Voronoi diagram. And the result is then something like this. So um, you get a sphere, you get these black points on the sphere, and then you see these regions of closest distances. And in this case, um, they are like spherically, um, they are spherical polygons surrounding these generator points. OK, so this, this algorithm in the back computes, computes the diagram. And you might wonder, um, what are the possible applications of spherical Voronoi diagrams, and why would one want to compute these? And so the thing is, I already told you, so my subject is mathematics. He does computational geometry. I didn't tell you yet Tyler's subject. And um, this is what I'm going to do now. Tyler is working in um, computational virology. This is a relatively new branch that um, uh, tries to, uh, to analyze how viruses work by means of computer models. And the viruses he's analyzing are viruses like the dengue virus or hepatitis C. And actually, the hepatitis C virus, for instance, is still quite, uh, quite a serious problem. There are 200 million infections worldwide. And once you have it, it's actually quite a nasty thing. It causes liver disease, cirrhosis, even liver cancer. And there are 350,000 deaths uh, per year. So, it would really be good if one could stop this, uh, this, this virus. And um, there is new medication available, so someone who is actually infected and has access to like, modern medical healthcare um, can get medication which is mostly successful, um, but very expensive. But actually, it would be much better to tackle this problem uh, before it arises. So for hepatitis type A and B, you're probably aware that there is a, a vaccination. 
Uh, just for curiosity, so who, who knows that, uh, that um, you are vaccinated against type A or B hepatitis? Okay, so actually quite a lot. Yeah. So in, in many countries, it's quite standard that even children get that quite early, I think. Um, it's, it's a very standard uh, thing. But for hepatitis C, you can't do it. Um, because there is no, currently no vaccine available and um, so this is a problem. You cannot stop this infection from spreading by means of a vaccine. So actually, um, this diagram I've just shown you, this could really be a virus. Yeah? So um, don't touch it. Um, this, this hepatitis C virus is very, very small, which is a problem when you want to study it um, because it's very difficult apparently to directly observe what these viruses do. As you can see, it is roughly a sphere and these generator points on that sphere, they roughly correspond to like proteins attached to this virus and the Voronoi regions um, around them, um, they, are like they are important for the virologists because they compute quantities like their surface area and then this is used uh, to do this actual virology research. As you, uh, as you just realized, I'm not an expert in virology. I have no professional knowledge about this at all. Um, all I know about this is from a few conversations with Tyler and Wikipedia. So um, I don't know um, how exactly this virological research is carried out. But I do know um, that um, they use these tools to compute these diagrams and they would really like to sort of yeah, build a, a better computer model of viruses like dengue or hepatitis C. In reality, these are quite large problem instances, so typically like 10,000 or 20,000 generator points on the sphere. Um, so you really, you really need um, something like a Python interface to compute uh, these problems. You can't just use a web applet and, and click in a few points. I mean, with, with 50,000 points or so, this is going to be uh, too much work. <laughs> And yeah, so this has now been finished and um, Tyler actually went to the US shortly um, uh, in, what was it, February and presented this at a, um, at a big conference for, for biophysicists and uh, other, to other computational um, uh, virology people. And um, I don't know, maybe there's more collaboration coming up. Uh, it might very well be that other people try to use that tool and maybe come up with, uh, with new ideas how to tackle um, this virus. There are two issues with this um, with this library which we would like to address in the future and um, in the tradition of this talk I also just um, just post these as a problems and if you if you would like to join in after the talk just uh, just say hi so the two things we are currently working on um, are the first of all the plots so as you see this plot here of the of the spherical Voronoi diagram this doesn't look terribly good uh, to say the least the problem is um, that the solution of the spherical Voronoi diagram um, comprises of these regions here and there are spherically, spherically convex spherical polygons and matplotlib doesn't have a built-in function uh, to build spherical polygons. So what you actually see here is I cheated. I added a lot of uh, generator points and then I just used this poly 3D collection to plot these regions in 3D. And because the vertices are all on the sphere, this looks as if they were all on the sphere. But as you can see here, um, in reality, they are not really exactly on the sphere. They are just slightly, uh, slightly below that. So it would be great if matplotlib could have um, uh, a functionality that allows you to also plot spherical um, polygons. That might be helpful for other purposes as well. And we opened a, another, um, another discussion here. There are a few ideas already there. Um, maybe um, in the near future this is completed, hopefully. And then one gets mm, plots about uh, these diagrams that look much more pretty. And the second problem is actually to compute um, their surface area. And again, this is not like an unsolved scientific mystery, but you run into a lot of practical issues. For instance, if you have like a very small sphere and loads of generator points, then you often have the problem that there are like degeneracies in the, in the polygons. Um, you have to be really careful um, about numerical instabilities and, and so on. And um, this is another project uh, we started to add this functionality uh, in this case to SciPy because um, yeah, that's really like a, a Python computing uh, library. Okay, so um, in the end I would like to say that this was my first uh, open source uh, project I've worked on and it was great fun. I mean, uh, the SciPy community is like really friendly. You get a lot of 
constructive uh, criticism. Um, your code is reviewed and in the end it's uh, really cool if you can sort of see how, how the, such a pull request like develops and in the end it gets released. And um, I can only recommend to everyone who wants to do this, just try it out. It's a nice community. And uh, I would like to thank everybody who was involved in this project, um, namely Tyler for giving this talk at the last conference, for everybody who, um, who worked on this uh, in between. And also a big thank you to the Pi Data organizers because I don't think we would have ever met at any other conferences because um, although uh, everybody who was involved regularly goes to scientific conferences, but we all have our, uh, our fields of, of, of expertise and then um, we would have never met. But this is actually an example of a problem we have to bring together um, the expertise of like various fields to actually uh, make that happen. And um, yeah, that was really cool. So if you ever want to use uh, the library, um, please feel free to, uh, to, 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 to check it out. It will be in the next release or you can clone the current master branch. Um, if you have any other ideas on how to use uh, spherical Voronoi diagrams, uh, please let me know. I'm of course interested uh, to learn uh, what other cool things one can do with it. And if you want to play around with it, you can go to this website, so to, to my GitHub, and I put a repository in there, and this contains um, a few examples of the, of the Voronoi diagrams. So this is like the planar case I've just shown you, and there are a few more Jupyter notebooks with examples that also use the, the spherical version, and then you can already see how it would look like um, once this version uh, is actually released. Okay, so um, yeah, you can of course always get in touch with me uh, about this topic and um, I think that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. <coughs> wow, we're exactly on time. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? Yes, please. Yeah, we thought about uh, this as well. They're actually, so one of these theoretical papers actually um, does the following. It takes the spherical setting and then it projects it to the plane and solves the problem in the plane and projects it back to the sphere. The problem with this is if you, um, so if you, if you imagine, where is it? So if you imagine this planar Voronoi diagram uh, in a, as being very small, sitting on a very large sphere, then what would happen is, is, is the following. So if you project the large sphere to the plane and compute the Voronoi diagram, the result you would get would be roughly correct on this small, on this small part of the sphere. But the problem is um, these regions here in the planar Voronoi diagram that are infinitely large, they don't really make sense on any sphere. Because if you have a region uh, in a planar Voronoi diagram that is infinitely large and you map that to the sphere, they start, I mean, the sphere is round, so they will meet sort of uh, behind and interfere. And in these parts, the Voronoi diagram will be wrong. And this is the problem if you just ignore the fact that the sphere has a different, uh, it's just a different type of space than, than the plane or even the entire R3, then you would have the same problem, right? You would, you would have cells that are infinitely large into, uh, into this, it would, be, would, would be infinitely large, and then it's sort of difficult to map that to the sphere back. Yeah. The three D. So you want to. So what exactly do you want to do? You want to put. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yes. The danger is probably if you intersect the result um, with a sphere, you have to sort of be careful that the points really are on the sphere, right? So if you have like vertices of your dia if you have vertices of your Voronoi cells, they might not automatically be on the sphere, and then you have to think about how to project them accurately on the sphere. Uh, yeah, no, that's the point. Unless you may wear on the sphere. So so the 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 yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the problem is, although all the generator points are on the sphere, 
uh, if you compute it in 3D, then the result points, the vertices and the regions and, and what you just said, they won't automate, they won't be on the sphere in general. Yes. And this is the problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if we if we have a bit more time, I can sort of um, uh, tell you a bit more of the technical details. Um, I put that into the end. So. So we basically. So they're like. Hmm? So this solution is for um, for a s for an arbitrary sphere. So the examples I show you are for the unit sphere, but you can uh, take any radius or any center and compute it. I'm not sure if that works on an on a deformed spheroid or something. Yeah, okay. But then you quickly run into the problem of like computing spherical Voronoi diagrams on like arbitrarily differently curved spaces, and I think. Yeah. I mean, but feel free, you can improve the library with the next pull <laughs> request to make that happen. Um, so essentially, the, the algorithm, um, I, can, I can show you two things. How much time do we have left? Uh, More than 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. I'll show you two things. Um, so first of all, um, if you actually want to compute something, you have to think about your data structure, how to put these diagrams into any data structure in Python. And most of it is pretty straightforward. So I mean, as I just said, so the points, they are basically just a, a NumPy array. And um, once you compute your, your, your Voronoi diagram, the vertices of the diagram, they are also just a NumPy array. In, for, the, for the planar case, it's a 2D array, and for the spherical case, it will be a 3D array. But storing these regions, this is a bit more tricky. So um, the, the way SciPy handles the, the planar case is as follows. The regions of the Voronoi diagram, this will be a list of tuples, and these tuples will have integers in it. And the way to read this is as follows. So at, let's say, the second, the second entry of this list is supposed to be the Voronoi region surrounding the second generator point. And these indices here are the indices of the, of the Voronoi vertices. That's a bit weird to read at first, but um, I guess this way of, I mean, this is a very computationally efficient way of storing the information you need um, in order to describe these, um, these regions. So these are the data structures that are used for the, for the planar case as well as for the spherical case. And the algorithm um, that computes the diagram in the spherical case does the following. So in the first step, you take the generator points on the sphere, for instance, like this. So the blue points are, are all these generator points. And actually, what you now do is you do use um, a 3D uh, Delaunay triangulation. So we just had a discussion of how to reduce this to a 3D problem, right? So this, this computes the 3D uh, Delaunay triangulation, or the convex hull, uh, actually, which is basically the same in this case. And then you add the origin of the sphere, or the center of the sphere, which in this case is the origin. And then you get loads of, uh, of tetrahedra that lie inside that sphere. And because it's slightly difficult to see, uh, to see this if you really have all these tetrahedra, let's take a look at one of them. So these three points are three points, three generator points on your sphere. And this point here is the origin. And what we do is we compute something which is called the circumsphere of that tetrahedron. That is simply the smallest sphere you can imagine where this tetrahedron still fits in. And this sphere will also have a center. And this is this red point here. In general, this center will again not be on the original sphere itself. But if you look at it from the side, so this will be like the red point, will be, this will be somewhere here. But what you can do is you can project this point onto the sphere and get this red point here. Yes, you have to know the radius of the sphere, exactly. And then you can sort of project that slightly onto, um, onto the sphere, and then you get that red point. And now if you iterate this process for all these tetrahedra I've shown you, then you get a bunch of these slightly red points on the sphere. And then actually, um, you can use some of this theory to, um, to show that these are the vertices of the spherical Voronoi diagram. So that actually gives you the vertices. Um, it is a bit more tricky to actually get these regions. Because if you just have like a random, randomly ordered um, array of these vertices, you still have to organize this array in some point to understand which vertices belong to which generator. 
And um, in order to do this, you really need this neighborhood information from this triangulization. You, re you really need to know um, which points are uh, close to which other points, which points are neighbors, which points are not neighbors. Um, it's, also, uh, it's also helpful to, to have that in order to get these points in an ordered fashion. So if you want to plot a spherical polygon, it's kind of helpful if you have the vertices ordered, like counterclockwise or clockwise, because otherwise... Yeah, Be because otherwise, otherwise even this poly 3D collection runs insane. If you give it uh, the vertices in the wrong order, it will plot like totally weird uh, objects and um, you can't see anything at all. So at the moment, uh, we have a, a routine you can call and then it sorts the, the vertices and then you can put it into this poly 3D collection. But the idea is that as soon as matplotlib has this functionality to plot spherical uh, polygons, one would rather use that one. Um, but as you can see, if, if there are loads of generator points, you can already see more or less um, how this diagram will look like. So this is like the, the algorithm and um, just, just a summary. So you calculate the 3D Delaunay triangulation of the generator points. You add the center of the sphere you get a tetrahedralization of these points. You calculate all the circumcenters of all the circumspheres of each tetrahedron, and this gives you the Voronoi vertices. And then in a second step, you have to use this neighborhood information from the triangulization to actually infer which vertices belong to, to which region. And then you can at least see roughly how the plot looks like using the current functionality of matplotlib. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here. Um, if you have any further questions, I will, of course, be around and happy to, to discuss uh, um, whatever questions you might have. Thank you very much. Okay.